Okay, so we'll get to Trump in a minute, but first I want to talk about how not to talk about English teachers. You may have seen a meme out there that goes something like this. So you have a line, uh, the one I've seen goes like this, the curtains were blue. As the meme goes, what your English teacher thinks the author meant is something like, the curtains represent his immense depression and his lack of will to carry on. And then what the author really meant is, the curtains were blue. So common sense tells us that when we try to interpret meaning from, broadly speaking, any utterance or text, whether that utterance be me talking right now to you, a stanza from a poem, a line from a novel, a piece of art, we ought to privilege what the author intended, right? Well, what did the author mean, we ask? So knowing the author's intention equals knowing the utterance's meaning. No, why no? It's called the intentional fallacy. William K. Wimsett Jr. and Monroe C. Beardsley talk about this in their famous 1946 essay of the same name. Basically, the idea is we can't get in the head of someone else. Wimsett and Beardsley argue that the author's intentions are fundamentally unavailable to us as interpreters. You can think about how we figure out the correct meanings of utterances and texts all the time with little or no knowledge of the creator's intentions. What this means is that the author isn't the one who magically imbues an utterance or a text with meaning. Wimsatt and Beardsley put it this way, and when they say poem, just know that they sort of mean any crafted utterance or text. The poem is not the critic's own or the author's. It is detached from the author at birth and goes about the world beyond his power to intend about it or control it. The poem belongs to the public. Wimsatt and Beardsley provide some good examples here and in other places about some factors that go into frustrating or even corrupting an author's intentions. Time can be a factor. The meanings of words and symbols change over time, and what an author meant by a word 150 or 10 years ago will not necessarily be the way it's understood today or even 100 years from now. Reproduction can be another factor. Poor copying of a text can corrupt what the author may have meant by it. Just the other day, Medieval POC shared this example of bad museum photography of a 17th century painting by Paul Van Somer, which actually removes significant parts of the text, changing its meaning as a whole. But there are a couple of other really important ways that intention as meaning is made problematic. Imagine an abstract sculpture, Beersley says. The sculptor intends it to mean human destiny. But this is what you see. Try as you might, you just can't see human destiny in this sculpture. So, says Beersley, do we say that we've just missed the symbolism, but that it must be there because the artist says it is? Or is the question rather that the object can be made to mean human destiny? Beersley says the latter because otherwise anyone could say that anything means anything they want just by saying it does. This implies, as Wimsett and Beersley argue, that to find meaning to interpret utterances, it's more effective to find evidence internal to the text itself rather than in the author's intentions. But let's look at the other side of this coin, namely Donald Trump. Consider the controversial image that the US presidential candidate tweeted out a few weeks ago attacking his opponent Hillary Clinton. The image was widely criticized for its anti-Semitic tropes, particularly the coupling of a six-pointed star with claims of corruption, symbology that's been used for a very long time to do serious damage to and denigrate Jewish people. Against this criticism, Trump and his media team argued that not every six-sided star is a Star of David, that this one was in fact the shape of a sheriff's badge. But here's the thing, even if Trump did not intend for the image to contain anti-Semitic meaning, it did. And that's because meaning isn't in the hands of the author, or the sharer in this case. Beersley writes that, quote, a text can have meanings that its author is not aware of. Therefore, it can have meanings that its author did not intend. Therefore, textual meaning is not identical to authorial meaning. Whether or not Trump was aware of or intended to convey anti-Semitism against Clinton, which, since the image was found to have originated on a white supremacist image board, is debatable, we can't say then that it doesn't have that meaning embedded within it just because he says so. Meaning doesn't flow from the author, it flows, as Beersley writes, quote, from the public conventions of usage that are tied up with habit patterns in the whole speaking community. Another theorist, Roland Barthes, who I'll be talking about in a later vlog, puts it a different way. He says that it is actually language itself that speaks. On the level of granular and aggregate signs that we all as a public agree 
mean stuff that is linguistically, Barth writes, quote, the author is never more than the instance writing. According to Barth, the author is like a mechanism through which language is propelled outward. But that language already has its meaning insofar as the audience agrees that it does. We can't simply push a button or issue a command such that this excited star shall henceforth only signify a sheriff's badge. No, the six-sided star and symbols of corruption had already been established as it were in the public domain as signs used to denigrate and conspiratorialize against Jewish people. We as a public, as a collection of thinking, speaking human beings are the ones who inevitably if not always intentionally, construct meaning. So then, what are the implications for the fact that meaning doesn't come from the author? How then does meaning work? I'm planning on doing a few more videos here like this one on literary theory, specifically about how language and meaning function. Next time I'm going to try to answer those questions by looking at semiotics, the study of how we attribute meanings to signs in the first place. If you don't want to miss it, now is a good time to subscribe. William Satin Beardsley write quite a bit more than I could fit on this video about intentionalism and some of the problems that arise when you take intentionality out of meaning making. So check out the work cited in the doobly-doo. Thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe and do tell all your friends.